Okay, so that's three nails. Another nail. Mating pair. Mating pair? Yep. Submerged? Uh, yes. Males 311327. Horseshoe crabs are actually found throughout all the estuaries on Long Island. So they're an important part of the ecosystem that we have here. We try to sample sites every year, and we're using that to try to monitor the status of the population. One of the main reasons we are so worried about horseshoe crabs is because many species of shorebird eat horseshoe crab eggs as they migrate north in the spring. At this point in time, we don't have sufficient data, particularly here in New York, to say to the extent of the drastic reduction in the horseshoe crab, or is it fairly stable? I think it's really important that people learn about the horseshoe crab, uh, the role that horseshoe crab has played in people's lives every day. When they understand that connection, it really kind of makes a person change that maybe they're whole impression of what the uh, organism is and why it's valuable not only to the ecosystem but to their own lives. The horseshoe crab is um, actually not a crab. It's in its own class called Meristomata. It's more closely related to scorpions and spiders. They've been around for a very long time. About 450 million years is the most recent estimate. They annually come inshore in the spring to spawn and deposit their eggs in the sand that hatch out and um, you know, become small horseshoe crabs and join the population later on. Horseshoe crabs are harvested as bait, mainly in the conch and the eel fishery. For the last several years, the conch fishery has really been increasing, so a majority of the horseshoe crabs, certainly in New York, are being used to catch conch. More recently, in the medical field, they found that the horseshoe crab blood will react to toxins that are produced from certain types of bacteria that can cause harm to people. And so they've been utilizing horseshoe crab blood to test everything that goes into human bodies with this compound, it's called Limulus amoebocyte lysate, LAL. We actually, as humans, are getting some real benefit from the horseshoe crabs, and so if we were good to let this species go extinct, right now, it'd be a real problem for us. Horseshoe crabs weren't actually a regulated fishery for a very long time, which meant that people can harvest whatever levels of, uh, you know, that they needed and at any size that they wanted. There was a decline, not actually that was detected in horseshoe crabs, but it was first detected in the migratory shorebirds. The red knot starts its migration down in South America. It um, travels up to Delaware Bay, and its timing overlaps with the spawning of the horseshoe crabs. There's massive amounts of eggs that are are readily available for the shorebirds to feed on. And they need that energy reserve to not only fly up to the Arctic, but they also need to forage and feed the young. And the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission started regulations on horseshoe crab up and down the coasts. And that's what started the monitoring program. The red knot was just listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Numbers just have not rebounded enough. And hopefully with this threatened status, it will bring more attention to the fact that we do need to protect its wintering grounds, breeding grounds, as well as their feeding grounds, the stopover points like Jamaica Bay and Delaware Bay. It's really important to monitor both numbers of red knots and horseshoe crabs over time to see if numbers are increasing or if they continue to decline or if they stay stable. One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, Six males in the submerged, two in the surf. Horseshoe crab monitoring, we started looking at sites and developing it back in 2005. And since 2007, we've had a pretty consistent survey where we have several sites around Long Island, uh, North Shore, South Shore, and Peconic Bay. In this harbor, or most of Long Island, the spawning season basically starts in mid-May, during the high tide, whether it's the new moon or the full moon. Horseshoe crabs come up on the sandy beaches primarily, sometimes a mud, sand 
a substrate where the female She's can easily right grow here. into the She's sand. To and males gather kind of around her the sand and, and, and get then down fertilize deep into the sediment the and then lay her eggs. Here in Mount Sinai, we move from one area to the next, counting the horseshoe crabs and also determining whether they're male or female. So uh, three, three males in the surf? Yep. This female is 27.4. Another aspect is measuring the width of the carapace. It gives us an idea of the age of the crab. And the third aspect is to tag the horseshoe crabs. 305. Six, nine, four. That information tells us where the horseshoe crabs move to. It also will tell us if we get repeat sightings at a beach, are they coming back during that spawning season? Are they coming back to the same beach or a different Two, beach? Nine, it looks like the horseshoe crabs that are in New York tend to stay in New York. In the end, what we're getting is an index of spawning potential for each of those beaches and we can compare it from year to year. If we find we're seeing a declining trend in an area for a number of years, we may decide to put increased management Sorry. in that area yeah. to protect the crabs. Two, nine, two, one, four, five. Two, nine, two, one, four, five. We have hundreds of volunteers that help us every year count horseshoe crabs and shorebirds, which is great because they might come out really not knowing what the issues are or might think horseshoe crabs are scary at first and they get out on the beaches and they, they discover that this is a really amazing ecosystem, an amazing species, and they become stewards of these beaches that are practically in their backyard. Plum Beach is one of the more heavily utilized bays in New York. It's a very, very important spawning habitat in a very urban surrounding. A major thing that Cornell Cooperative Extension has done is really educated the community and how to help save the lives of horseshoe crabs. Because uh, of his telson and this area of movement that occurs, my, my gut feeling is that they're still alive. And yeah, they are. They're really, they're both, they're both pretty dry and it's not yet complete, um, complete high tide. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put them both um, in the water. I feel very dedicated to seeing how we can conserve their life. It's very important to continue the collection of data that we're doing. I'd like to be involved with the horseshoe crabs because in the past I was engaged in uh, commercial fishing and seafood processing where we used the horseshoe crabs for bait. So when we are sampling horseshoe crabs and merely counting and measuring and then returning to the water and there's a commercial fishing uh, effort in that area, I can then share the other side of the picture. I myself lean more towards preserving the population of horseshoe crabs now rather than the taking of them, but one has to understand both sides of it. So that's why the Department of Environmental Conservation here in New York and other states regulate the harvest. For helping with conservation, I think one of the greatest things that was of benefit to the horseshoe crabs was enacting regulations. So each of the states is given a, a total quota uh, for what they can harvest. Um, some states, such as New York, uh, are given about 366,000 individual horseshoe crabs, they actually choose to uh, voluntarily reduce that because they know that the reporting on the harvest is not 100% accurate. Other states actually have complete moratoriums where they completely have shut down the fisheries. And even on Long Island, if there's a known shorebird and horseshoe crab relationship that's been established, the state has the ability to close these areas. Overall, uh, the, the data is really starting to take shape now where we can look at the trends and, and use the statistics to do trend analysis. What we've noticed is that the Long Island Sound and the Peconics have been a lot lower um, overall probably from where they were and it really hasn't been rebounding or anything. It's just kind of been holding a low kind of steady average. There's been a lot higher numbers in the Great South Bay and South Terrestrial areas and 
they're kind of holding their own as well. The Jamaica Bay has shown an increase. It's not significant, but it's what we call marginally significant, so if we had a few more replicate samples, we'd probably get significance. So it varies around the island. We're just starting to get interesting data now where we can make these kind of statements. And I think the emphasis should be on collecting in well into the future. I think it's just really important to conserve and protect all of our species. Part of the goal of the Department of Environmental Conservation is to sustain our natural resources, not only for the people here today, but for people coming in the future. We do think it's important not just to collect this data, but also to have this connection between people and their environment. People have ownership in their backyard of these things, and that's something that uh, you can't place a value on because it's sort of stewardship that's inherent. It's because they're spawning right on the edge of the beach, people see it, and it brings the marine environment to the people. Most of the time it's in that big black box and nobody knows what's going on. And so it makes people think about their environment more and think about what they're doing to the earth.